everybody, we're live. And I'm joined tonight by Scootaloo and Discount Engineer. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's great to be here. here. <laughs> Thanks for having us on. You're very welcome. And so let's, uh, let's start with some introductions. Uh, Scooty Lou, would you like to introduce yourself, let everybody know where they can find you, and uh, tell us about how you got into Dwarf Fortress, how long you've been streaming, that sort of thing. Absolutely, Sal. So, I stream over on Twitch, that's my primary platform, twitch.tv slash Scooty Lou. I'm also found over on YouTube, I have a channel for myself, just under Scooty Lou, and I also post my VODs under Scooty Lou VODs. And I'm trying to get started over on TikTok, so I would really appreciate follows over there. And I mainly stream Dwarf Fortress. I stream teaching Dwarf Fortress streams, and I like to do challenge runs as well, like one dwarf, one axe challenges, haunted biomes, one by one squares, whatever you want. I even take save files from chat, and I like to play them and help them work through their problems. I also play other difficult games like the Dark Souls series, Elden Ring, Escape from Tarkov, Super Smash Bros. Melee. I just really like challenges, and I'm really happy to be here promoting my favorite game of all time. I love <laughs> Dwarf Fortress, and gosh, I've been playing it forever. How did you get into Dwarf Fortress in the first place? Well, I spent some time on some forums on the internet, and I learned about roguelikes as a genre, and I saw that in roguelike forums, people would be talking about this beautiful megafauna of a game. I, I think of Dwarf Fortress a lot like an elephant. It's big and massive and intimidating, but there's just so much complexity and intelligence behind it. It's really not anything to be afraid of. So I looked up some videos on the internet. I got my start from 1F Jeff, He's Jeff Major over on YouTube. Back in the 4DD days, I did a lot of studying back when Dwarf Fortress didn't have Z levels. Uh -huh. And then when I went to Bay 12 Games slash Dwarves to download for the first time, I saw that there was a new version. The day was April 1st, 2010, and they were releasing version 31.00, which unbeknownst to me, had added Z levels and changed the complete foundation of the game from the 40d days so i really had to hit the ground rolling and learn everything new all on my own so i just thought about how i felt back then about not having a coach not having someone showing me the ins and outs of the game and i wanted to give new players a better experience and not gatekeep anything so that's why i'm here and that's why i stream cool cool and discount would you like to introduce yourself let people know sure. where they can find you on the internet and tell us about your Dwarf Fortress experience. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm Discount Engineer. I stream uh, solely on Twitch at the moment. Um, and yeah, I like to stream games that typically have like an engineering creativity type element to it. So uh, I like to Stormwork, Station Ears, Cobble Space Program, Oni, uh, sorry, Auction Not Included. Um, as well as like uh, that's my current sort of list of games, including Dwarf Fortress at the moment, um, sort of space engineers, that kind of thing, going back in history. Uh, yeah, um, and yeah, my my introduction to Dwarf Fortress was very very recently, and it was actually watching Self and Cell play it uh, on her streams. So nice. that's <laughs> and I've, I've been playing it since. Uh, basically the start of this year i think i've got four streams in and oh my goodness i did not know what i was getting myself into when i started it but uh yeah it's been a it's been a fun experience it's been a learning experience <laughs> and uh yeah yeah i'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to more of it <laughs> good stuff welcome to the crew indeed thank you thank you and uh, I suppose I should introduce myself every so now and then, because <laughs> uh, I, I often forget to do that. But um, yeah, because I'm here every, well, twice a week I'm here. Uh, I am Salford Sal, for those who don't know me. And I stream on Twitch. I stream usually six nights a week. And twice a, twice a week is on Kit Fox Games over here. Rest of the time I'm over on my own channel. 
um, where I'm streaming uh, Dwarf Fortress and a mix of other games at the moment, Oxygen not included, amongst other things. Uh, but yes, uh, Dwarf Fortress at least twice a week. On a Wednesdays and Friday evenings, I am coaching Honeyplay, who's a brand new player to the game. And uh, I I really enjoy coaching you people. <laughs> That's uh, that I find that a lot of fun. Uh, You're a blessing. <laughs> we need it. We need it. We couldn't make it alone. So tonight uh, we are going to be looking at the topic of refuse management and corpse management. Uh, but I think before we get into that, on my screen at the moment, we are looking at a Scootaloo's Fortress. Uh, it gets, uh, this, it's getting a little bit fuzzy from time to time, but mm -hmm. um, we'll, uh, I think we'll, we'll be able to cope with that. I think before we get into, oops, before we get into um, our topic for this evening, would you mind giving us a bit of a fortress tour? But I'm going to ask you to just... Um, try and move around the fortress a little bit slowly because it goes fuzzy when you move. Absolutely. And if it's a little bit too fuzzy, I could try streaming the direct game footage or maybe a desktop if you think that would help. We can we can try tinkering around with it. Just uh, let me know if it's still fuzzy. It's it's actually cleared up a little bit since you moved out of Stone Sense. Okay. Wonder if well, that's, that's got good. anything to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Give it a go. Let's see. Sure. So this fortress goes by the name of Cat Basement. It is an Egyptian-styled fortress over in a sandy desert where we worship cats and we involve ourselves very deeply in scholarly studies. At the very top here, at our gatehouse, we have two statues. We have an image of the oily hug of love, an image of a dwarf <laughs> and a cat. The dwarf is embracing the cat. And here is its compatriot. This is the Static of Fur. An image of a cat and a dwarf. The cat is embracing the dwarf. To let everybody know just how much we care about cats. <laughs> we have very strict rules that you are not allowed to butcher any cats, so you may see a few hundred roaming about. And this area through here honestly looks a lot better in ASCII because of the microcline bridges. Uh, the microcline road that we've set up that goes over to our not-so-great pyramids. <laughs> then we have a very slow dodging grinder over here where our dwarves are set to train and our minecarts push into them and they dodge past at very very low speeds nobody gets hurt and we even have our own egyptian sphinx over here that's where our mayor lives he holds dining meetings inside of its gut and holds his own meetings inside of its butt. <laughs> he sleeps in the cat's head. And then if I enable stone sense, let's hope it doesn't get too fuzzy here. Sure. This is what it looks like in stone oh, sense. Oh, wow, that looks fabulous. Would you like to just explain what stone sense is for those not familiar? Sure. So Stone Sense has been a 3D visualization utility that's been in Dwarf Fortress for a long time. And currently, to the best of my knowledge, in order to get Stone Sense working, you need to download a utility called DF Hack. You'll see that up in mm -hmm. this corner over here, I have the DF Hack utility installed. And you can press Control Shift D to open up a nice command line interface to run a lot of fantastic community tools for optimization, autom automation, and there there is some cheaty stuff in there. You can spawn in items, you can increase or decrease attributes and skills. There is so much to go through with DF Hack. I feel like we would need an entirely different stream to touch on all the lovely topics. Yeah, we'll maybe do a deep dive into DF Hack at some point. And because we worship cats, I thought it would be very appropriate to set up a gold monument to an Egyptian cat right across our River Nile from our not-so-great pyramids, as they are very small. <laughs> and then, I have a pretty simple farming setup here. Not too much micromanagement has gone into this, but I wanted to make sure we had enough stills 
that we had enough looms and farming workshops to get a nice textile industry running. Mm -hmm. And just to briefly touch could on you, some of the refuse and dumping. Could you yes? shrink stone sense? It's still covering oh, gosh. a yes. large part of Absolutely. the city. There, there we go. go. Now we can see a bit more of, of the setup here. Mm -hmm. I included diagonals here because the stinky gas that comes off of rotting flesh and corpses only travels north, south, east, west. So by setting up a tanner's workshop and a butcher's workshop diagonally, that contains the stink into those zones. To carry on with the fortress tour, we travel downwards, and this is a nice ramp that allows caravans to come on through. And this is a completely normal trading depot. The fact that there is a floodgate next to our River Nile and bridges set up, this is definitely not a drowning chamber. Don't worry, don't <laughs> worry. We can, we can service you in here and you will certainly live through it. Um, the fact that you haven't seen the broker in a few days means nothing. If we continue downwards. We go down to, I, I call this area splat. It's where I just get my tons and tons of workshops set up at the very beginning of a fortress. Mm -hmm. I set up my basic pastures in here with a few nest boxes. And I have a lovely hospital with a cistern set up that's activated by a lever. This feeds in from our river Nile through the use of water wheels and a screw pump that fills this up whenever we're empty. It's a lovely little setup. And over here, we have our guild halls that I make progressively more impressive as their demands get more and more impressive. These are engraved gold floors. Then, if we travel downwards even more, we enter into another underground pyramid setup that narrows down, right? And we have a massive crypt for the not-so-lucky dwarves that didn't make it. <laughs> we set down slabs to memorialize them. And over here is our apartment housing. Could you imagine having to trudge through multiple rooms and then up several sets of stairs just to get to your room? <laughs> we have our nice apartment block over here, which I set up using a nice little macro in Vanilla Dwarf Fortress. You don't need DF hack to do macros. I mm -hmm. love them. Sal, have you done tutorials on macros before? Um, not since the 4704 um, version. I see. Gosh, I, I love them. I really do love them. And then this is our museum. Just to increase the happiness of our dwarves, we have some cleverly placed mist generators to increase the happiness of our dwarves. One here down on our main living level and one here on what I call splat. Then if we go all the way down to the depths, we have color-coded magma industries, which I've made completely safe using my patented method of the vertical iron bar filter and magma-safe gabbro floodgate, which fills in these lovely trenches. So we don't have to worry about magma crabs, firemen, fire imps, or any of that messing with our dwarves. This was the first. And then I realized we needed to expand. So I created a second one using the same method. Mm -hmm. And I even gave them a lovely tavern down here by the name of Break Room. <laughs> I think that's a that's a pretty quick rundown. You know the complexity of this game. I could get lost the whole stream telling you all the ins and outs of this place. Indeed. But... Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, so what we'll do now, we'll switch over to my fortress. Um, I think chat's very familiar with my fortress. Let's just move you over to there. And uh, right, yes, here's my fortress. Now, I don't have much in the way of corpses. So up here, I've got a corpse stockpile. It is empty. And down here is my refuse stockpile, which is mostly butcher materials um, and some animals that died of old age within the fortress. Um, my butcher is next door to the refuse plot, 
but the corpse plot is hidden away behind closed doors. <laughs> and here, uh, underneath this drawbridge, is where I dispose of all of my garbage. So, uh, let's start by having a look at uh, how we would how I deal with getting rid of some some of the rubbish. Um, first thing I want to know is, do I have any garbage dump zones? And it doesn't appear as though I do. Nope, good. Okay, so I'm gonna get a dwarf to come up and pull this lever. And we're going to clear out the rubbish in this uh, refuse zone. And then we'll talk about some of the settings on refuse zones and garbage zones. And why, the, why I've got mine set up the way they are. And I'm interested in if either you, Scooty, uh, Scooty Lou, or Discount, if you've got anything different. Or Discount, if you've got any questions about why things are done is, the way they are uh, just feel is this a completely open area yeah um, ah it's um it has a roof on it um, okay with some windmills um <laughs> but it was once open uh sorry it was one it used to be the surface if i scroll out it was a very very flat map and I'm in a part of the world where there is an enormous number of um, of necromancer towers. There's 32 necromancer towers in the vicinity. And also we have a road running through the fortress as well. So you can see the road on the mini-map up there. Um, so I wanted to very quickly, I think it was my first migrant wave, someone Bought, someone brought some pets with them and they were pet grazers so I wanted very quickly to be able to make the fortress secure uh, just to make sure that if we got raided because when you've got the undead tramping around the grounds they they don't have a trigger to come and raid you they're not waiting for you to become a big fortress they're not looking at a certain amount of wealth or anything um, they'll attack you as soon as they find you and they're just out scouting the the neighborhood uh, so I wanted to get the wanted to keep my grazing animals safe very quickly so what I did was to dig a trench around the outside and if we scroll down yep we see the bottom of the trench here and I when I dug the trench I left an overhang uh, it once we get up uh, two or three layers uh, it overhangs by one block and that meant that nothing could climb up onto the fortress so that was before I built walls around it I dug the trench and the overhang because dwarfs can dig a lot faster than they can build so for them to dig a trench around the outside with an overhang that was a lot faster for them to get this uh, this area safe and then I just dug a tunnel to the outside with uh, with a drawbridge to to keep the bad guys out. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. The overhang is so strong; it will yeah. keep anything that can climb out of there. Legendary climbers like cats and spiders they can't they can't overcome an overhang. Indeed. Uh, so that's what we're doing now. Then eventually, I did um, I did get walls around. It wasn't that long before I got raided. Um, I think it was it was the first summer that something um, discovered us here because I got a siege notification, but it immediately disappeared. So somebody had clipped the corner of the map and it happened so fast I didn't actually get a chance to see. Um, but then early, uh, it was in year two, our second year here, uh, we got a full siege by the undead. So I presume it was necromancers that had found us here. And I hadn't, by that point,
point got round to building a full wall. I had some pieces of wall, but yeah, they were standing up the, on the banks trying to take pot shots at the animals because they brought some raiders with them. Uh, some crossbow... I'm trying to remember whether they were goblins or whether they were dwarfs. I think there was a mix of different undead species in, amongst them. Were they intelligent enough to use weapons on you? Oh, yeah. That's uh, a little scary. Yeah, just corpses. But um, they did have some lieutenants with them as well. The lieutenants had special powers. If they waved their hands, whatever they waved their hands at would be sent flying at, um, at high speed um, until they crashed into something. Now, thankfully, my animals were too far away from the lieutenants for the lieutenants to try and attack. But uh, I could see what was going on with the local wildlife. They were killing the local wildlife by waving their hands at the wildlife. Wow. A uh, question from chat. Can a tree branch cover that distance? So, no, that's why this moat is so wide. The moat is eight tiles wide because a tree branch can only grow out by three. Um, before I'd built the wall, there was trees growing right on the edge here. So that meant that the tree branches on my side of the island were growing out three and the tree branches on the enemy's side of the island was growing out by three. So there was always a gap of two in between. And as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that can jump a gap of two. Uh, if there's only a gap of one, there are some things that will jump that. Um, or at least attempt to, and sometimes make it. So I found that having a moat that is eight wide at the top, or a trench that's eight wide, and then that overhang just stops any of them from climbing up. Doesn't keep us safe from things that fly, but... Um, Unless you're dealing, unless you're in a savage biome and you're worried about very aggressive birds, um, this, this sort of arrangement was keeping me safe from early attack very quickly and can deal with 98% of the things that we were worried about. And then by about year three, about the end of year three, I'd got a, a roof put on here. We were completely sealed in. I've broken into the roof um, to come and play with power. But um, yeah, prior to that, we were um, completely sealed. A pretty uh, good power setup, I gotta say. Is, <laughs> is your frame rate handling the game pretty well? Oh, no problem, now? yeah. Great. I have my frame rate limited to 30. Uh, so that the dwarves move at a speed which is comfortable for viewers to follow. Yeah. I've always found that to be a, a nice, comfortable speed. All right. So now what we're going to do is get rid of the rubbish uh, in the refuse here. I'm going to do that by going to zones, garbage dump, and I'm going to put a one by one tile just there. So... If I hold my cursor here, you'll see that up in the message, it says that it's an open space. So there's a little one by one hole just there. And that hole leads down to a room below. And I've put my garbage dump right next to the hole. So if you put a garbage dump and then tell them to dump things and the dump zone is next to a hole, instead of putting stuff in the dump zone, they'll throw it over the edge instead. So that's what we're going to get them to do now. We'll tell them to dump everything in here. Now, Sal, mm -hmm. I, I noticed that you're dumping everything inside of that stockpile. Can I ask what your stockpile settings are? Yes, yeah, certainly. So this is a refuse stockpile. And um, the way I have this set up, I don't allow them to... So it's a standard ref refuse stockpile, but only allows corpses and body parts. And then the item types. Uh, under item types, I ban fresh rawhide. Because 
anything that oh and raw fish yeah 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 forgot about that um fresh raw hide raw fish because a refuse stockpile causes things to deteriorate um it decomposes stuff um, quite quickly it means that i don't actually have to throw away the refuse quite often because uh, a lot of it will just decompose away to nothing in here but some stuff like the the animal especially the animal skeletons um they will be around for a long time i've got a question for mm. you about refuse and its there effects on deteriorating clothes yeah I've had someone come to my chat before and say that they set up only specific dwarves who live in squalor to handle jobs like that because when they walk in, the mere act of walking into the refuse stockpile deteriorates their clothes. I don't think that's the case, but I didn't have a way to prove it. Do you have a definitive answer? Mm, I don't have a definitive answer, but I don't believe it's the case because something that a dwarf is wearing won't actually be be in the stockpile right so if you drop something on a stockpile it's not in the stockpile unless it's placed in the stockpile so um if like for example if we look on the food stockpiles um something like uh, like we've got buckets and socks and mugs and all kinds of things in the food stockpile here i'm pretty sure that they're not actually in the stockpile uh, they're not taking up a space in the stockpile so this mug here um is on the stockpile but not in the stockpile right i think dwarfs walking over it i don't believe that that would cause their clothes to deteriorate i certainly haven't seen any difference in the speeds not something i've ever noticed um i'm just trying to think if there's any if i've ever seen any indication of anything strange happening i'm not sure if it's i, I have a recollection somewhere that i read that stuff that's in the open air decays quicker is that correct or is that am i making that up i can't remember if i've read that or not i don't the if you've got food that's not in a food stockpile that will certainly decay um i don't think that stuff that's in the open air will decay quicker if you put something okay. in a refuse stockpile it'll decay quicker than it would have if it was something that was going to decay so some stuff just won't decay most things won't decay by themselves but if you put them in a refuse stockpile they will right okay um so a worn out sock will like that shoe there we've got uh, a worn out shoe that shoe could have been there for years <laughs> Um, this is a 13 year old foot uh, that shoe might have been there for 15 years now if that shoe was brought to this refuse stockpile then it would probably last hmm, depending on quite how worn it is maybe six months um, and then it would deteriorate to nothing to give a little more perspective about how bad things can go, mm -hmm. I remember I tuned into somebody's Dwarf Fortress stream. They were new to the game, and for, for some reason, they had a large stockpile that contained everything. It contained refuse and armor and weapons and all sorts of things, and they had just started up steel. So they made steel breastplates, and they were getting put into the, the stockpile that shared refuse, and after just a few days, they were already getting deteriorated. And they were asking, why is this happening? And that that's why. Just because they're sharing that with refuse, no matter how small, it seems to have a pretty profound effect. Yeah, if you set up a stockpile for all. Um, so if I put down a new stockpile and say that that is all, and then we have a look at that settings, it's Ooh. become a refuse stockpile. And a stockpile that affects, that accepts refuse 
uh, will have this deterioration effect on stuff. So, yeah. Um, if you're ever putting down stockpiles that contain multiple different items, always exclude your refuse. Because if it includes refuse, then it's going to cause stuff to deteriorate. Yeah. It's yeah. also a good idea to take eggs and seeds off and stone. There, there are so many things that I would personally take off, but that's just, yeah. that's just my play style. Yeah. Um... So yeah, in terms stone of, um, and all kinds. Yeah, indeed. Yeah? Yeah, I was going to say, in terms of old clothing and stuff, mm -hmm. it, from the trades that I've seen, they're quite happy to take old clothes. So what's the advantage of putting that, that smelly sock that you've got right there in a stockpile <laughs> versus <laughs> selling it to the next human trader that comes along? <laughs> so there's only really one advantage to not selling your old clothes. And that is when you sell old clothes... Uh, and this is true of anything. When you sell anything, the thing doesn't cease to exist. It, the thing is taken out into the world and continues a life beyond your fortress. Goodness, I am so sorry to my world. <laughs> <laughs> All the stinky socks from this kind of fortress. <laughs> Infecting the world. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. In a previous version of the game, I'd um, I'd sold mountains and mountains of old clothes. Uh, it would be my main trade good, and then I reached a point in my fortress where everything was happy and calm, and we'd done everything we wanted to do. So I retired the fortress and went into adventure mode. And took a party out to explore the world because we'd learned things and I wanted to go and see some of these things that we'd learnt about. Um, and uh, as we were wandering around in adventure mode, I came across a village. I think it was a human hamlet. And there were so many of my old clothes in that human hamlet. It was ridiculous. There was just like... It's like this entire town was just littered with so many worn out dwarf trousers <laughs> um, so it does actually have uh, if you have problems with your frame rate for example you might want to destroy old clothes rather than sell them uh, and you might want to restrict your trading to stuff that will deteriorate by itself uh, such as food if you sell food the food will eventually deteriorate. It won't continue to live its own existence because uh, eventually it will it will decompose to nothing out there. Um, yeah, but if same you... Is, I suppose the same is true of making amulets and like bone necklaces. Yeah, bone, indeed. Like, yeah, anything. Right, mm. okay, okay, that's a lesson learned. But on the other hand, if you do plan on taking an adventure party out into the world, it's not a bad idea to get your fortress to make a bunch of stuff and send all kinds of useful things for you out into the world. So if, um, if you know that you're going to take a, an adventure party of a combination of dwarfs and humans and kobolds, you might want to sell a whole load of steel armour in small, medium, and large size, <laughs> and uh, you such a beautiful interconnected game. I can't Indeed. wait for adventure mode. I'm can't looking wait. forward to adventure mode coming out. <laughs> uh, you could litter the world with artifact weapons, and then when you go wandering around in adventure mode, if you've sold enough of them, you should be able to find some of them out there somewhere, and um, yeah, makes the acquisition of really good armor and weapons a bit easier for you you just got to find out where where the trader went when he left your village <laughs> when he left your fortress <laughs> but yet yeah, you are uh, when you trade you are littering the world with all your stuff but yet yeah, that's the that's the only reason why you might choose not to sell uh, old clothes i know with my current fortress my my world must be so full of cut gems. <laughs> There'll be, uh, there's just diamonds all over the world. 
because yeah. that's the uh, the and that's my main trade good with the elves as well. So there must be forests just full of uh, cut gems and prepared meals and wooden bolts and copper <laughs> bolts, encrusted ammo. I'm I'm sure that it's going to be insane getting to explore the world in adventure mode and see dwarf fortress in all of its graphical splendor once we, once we have a release i'll have to look at your old videos sal so i can learn a thing or two about adventure mode because i got really into it in version 34.xx yeah and i kind of fell off after they introduced dancing and being able to accept adventures in a different way and converse with people i kind of fell off because i was doing my college studies at wow. the time, so I, I really need to get back into it. <laughs> yeah, now in adventure mode, you can take multiple people out in a party. Uh, you can take up to six people, and um, I know I took a party of six people and six animals, and you can, uh, you can have necromancers' experiments as part of your crew as well. Which means that when you take a necromancer experiment as part of your crew you don't know what kinds of special powers you're going to be getting which um yeah interesting yeah now you're just exciting me for the magic release <laughs> i've been wanting that since forever and ever oh man all the emergent magic systems high magic Indeed. low magic creation myth. i could go shaking my head <laughs> what have i got myself into <laughs> oh, it's, oh, oh just you wait just you wait Oh. I, so, I'm just curious, what were your initial impressions of Dwarf Fortress before you started playing, and what, what got you interested in the game? Oh, so my origin story, um, I had heard, it was before I, well, no, I was between gaming computers. I went uh, a few years after my gaming computer that I'd previously had, had expired. It was then a few years before I could afford another computer that I could play games on. And so I went through this um, patch in my life where I wasn't able to, I mean, I was so desperate to play games. I was doing, I was playing Farmville on my phone and on my phone and stuff like that. Um, and so I really got into watching Let's Plays and Twitch. I was playing vicariously through other people. And I kept on coming across people talking like they'd be introduced in a new game and they'd say this is inspired by Dwarf Fortress I'd never mm. heard of Dwarf Fortress um, but it kept on cropping up as the game that inspired all of these other games and I, I just sort of filed it away in the back of my head thinking at some point I'll be browsing YouTube for something to watch and there'll be nothing I fancy so next time I get one of those moments, I shall do a search on Dwarf Fortress and I'll find out what it's all about. Um, yeah, it was just one of those, must look into that one day. And then that one day came where it was like, no, there's nothing I fancy watching. I'll look into that thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a look at that, that game, Dwarf Fortress, I heard people talking about. Let's see if I can find anything about it. And did a search on Dwarf Fortress and it uh, found a video, I uh, found out that Avak was part way through a, his first playthrough of Dwarf Fortress. So this is about 2012. And uh, Avak was somebody who I'd watched doing other things anyway. And it's like, oh, let's watch this. Somebody I like watching, playing something that I want to find out something about. And he was maybe about six or seven episodes into his first playthrough and I was about an episode and a half in and I was like I've got to play this game <laughs> I've so got to play this game this is because uh, as soon as I start when I'm watching somebody play something if I'm if I find myself going, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Or, oh, why doesn't he do this? I'd do it like this. I want to do it like that. I wish I could play this. <laughs> when I start coming up, when it inspires me to do things different, that's when I know it's a game for me. Uh, if it starts firing up my imagination and I'm thinking, yeah, let's do a three wide moat instead of a one wide moat. And isn't someone going to get trapped down there? Um, when I start questioning those things, um, so that was 2012 
I didn't get a gaming computer until uh, an, until 2014, and in that time, I watched as many videos as I could. I watched as many tutorials as I could, because. I uh, just by watching stuff, I understood that this was a game that had, especially back then, uh, back in 2012, this was a game that had a barrier to entry because there was lots of complex controls that were unintuitive <laughs> and that you had to learn how to control the game in a way that we really don't have to these days. The control systems are so much more intuitive now compared to how yeah. they used to be. It's still, I mean, it's a game of massive complexity and it still has a learning curve to it, but it doesn't have that same hurdle as the the old Unix-style command system used to have. Very true. A, a point-and-click interface on its own is a huge boon. People have been talking about it for years and years, yeah. and now that we have a point-and-click interface, I'm, I'm kind of shaking my old man fist at the sky, asking for more hotkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the advantage of everything is new to me, so it's like, I don't miss anything, I don't, you know, it is all just new discovery, it's, <laughs> it is what it is, I don't need to worry about it. Okay. Missing you know, something I'm, or not missing it. Indeed. I'm very curious about what got you interested in the game, Discount Engineer, and, and what your first impressions were when you first started it up. I, I'm sure it was, oh gosh, what have I gotten myself into? But starting yeah, with the bit. advent I mean, of the Steam I, yeah. version, it's a lot more user-friendly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had zero exposure to Dwarf Fortress before the Steam version. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was kind of like looking at the mechanical systems. People were mucking about with water flows and floodgates and like, you know, mechanical pulleys and all this sort of stuff. I was like, okay, pumps. Uh, yeah, okay, that's that's in my wheelhouse. I, I, I understand that logic. I can, yeah, I can get behind that. I can do some fun stuff, hopefully. Um, yeah, and then it's then started to see like other little bits and it's like, oh, you need to make potash. You need to make lye. Well, okay, okay. I've got a basic understanding of like the chemistry there involved. It's like, you need soap for hospitals. Wow. Okay. Right. All right. All right. I can do this. Tallow facts. Yeah, I know this. And uh, it's just, yeah, that, that whole snowball snowball effect. But yeah, I mean, my, my exposure to it has been very, uh, very limited. Um, I mean, I'm uh, four streams in and, and three fourths down. Uh, so it's a learning experience. But I, I kind of, I sort of have a different approach to, to get, I like to learn through my experience, I, I don't tend to go off and look for YouTube tutorials or stuff like that. I like to have first-hand experience and learn the lessons the hard way, if you like. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm. it is, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it is down the rabbit hole. It's like you, you take off one thing, you learn something, you think, right, I've got that figured out, and then something else pops up. Uh, and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's just the hints of stuff today, you know, like fire creatures coming out of the magma and like the und I've not seen any undead yet. I've seen demons. <laughs> my last thought died to demons. Heck yeah. Uh, but uh, nice. yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, okay. I can't wait to see what you're going to be creating in Dwarf Fortress once you have a mastery over the machinery and gear assemblies, axles, levers, pressure plates, and everything in between. I'd love to see what I've, you make. I've, I've had your plans. Real world <laughs> I had great plans for the last forts. Indeed. Just, just, they never quite got to fruition because, uh, yeah, like I say, we had a, a bit of a demon invasion. And uh, yes, yeah, well, yes. But yeah. excited, yeah, excited to see what the next one brings. <laughs> um, right. I'll just show this. So we've my dwarfs have dumped all of the stuff down here. And uh, what we're going to do is pull a drawbridge, uh, pull that lever up top there, and it's going to lower this drawbridge and crush all of that rubbish under there. But you see this pit here. Um, this is not ideal. Normally I would have this three wide, but I was in a... I was in a tight space here. My preference for a garbage disposal room is to have the hole in the top not touch any walls because I've had experiences in the past where I've got this far 
I've thrown a bunch of rubbish down the pit and then not got around to drawing to lowering the drawbridge and just left it there. And then a necromancer has come along and uh, and raised things that were down in the garbage pit. Um, <laughs> and I uh, so when I would come across this idea of using drawbridges and a pit to throw the rubbish down um, which I'd started doing uh, let me tell you about how I'd started and the lessons I learned along the way so I'd started off by realizing that it was a good idea to get corpses and refuse away from your dwarfs because they were getting upset by seeing certainly the uh, the corpses they didn't like seeing the corpses the refuse wasn't upsetting them but um, but I figured if I was going to be getting rid of corpses I might as well get rid of all of the intestines and and uh, um, the nervous tissue and cartilages and things that they stuff they wouldn't eat and down here I've probably got dog noses and things oh, no. um, all kinds of stuff um, so what I started doing was throwing the stuff off a cliff um, I the fortress where I first started getting rid of rubbish and corpses I had a river uh, it was a mountain fortress so there was there was a convenient ledge where I could throw all of the rubbish off a river uh, off the edge into a river but um, I then noticed that my fisher dwarves were going insane a lot faster than they were previously. And it turned out when I looked to see what was going on, because there was a fisher dwarf going berserk, I, uh, I noticed that what had happened was the river had pushed the corpses downstream. And now my fisher dwarves were fishing in an area that was full of like dead goblins and things. Um, and so I thought, yeah, okay, so maybe we don't just throw them off the edge. <laughs> maybe maybe that's not a good idea, just throwing all of the garbage into the river. Um, especially if my dwarves are then trying to access the river. As... Oh, zombies can swim! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then I started digging a pit and throwing the rubbish in a pit. And I realised that drawbridges could crush things to nothing. So I thought, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put a drawbridge down there and then we can crush all of the corpses and garbage and stuff. So I'd done that. Every, periodically, I would pull the, uh, the drawbridge and crush the garbage. But uh, yeah, one day I'd, um, I hadn't got round to pulling the lever to crush the garbage and a necromancer came raised a bunch of stuff and I was in the middle of a battle as well which is what scared the necromancer into raising the things um, and there was hands crawling up the wall to get out the pit and uh, and started crawling around the fortress I'd been using a lot of uh, sword dwarfs and so they'd been chopping hands off people off the, <laughs> the enemies so I had a fortress full of disembodied hands uh, crawling up the walls, escaping and attacking my dwarfs who were then getting really freaked out because there was undead body parts that they were fighting as well as goblins. Um, so, yeah, I... Oh, and when an undead beast was raised, that was when I knew I really needed to do something about it. Um, so I... Bear in mind that I am sometimes neglectful. <laughs> I'll sometimes forget to pull the lever again. I found that if I made this room here a three by three room and then had the hole um, so that it wasn't next to any wall, there'd be that overhang that would mean that nothing could climb up. Uh, the other thing that I try and do is if possible again in this fortress it wasn't because of the space constraints but i try to dig my garbage pit down to a stone level because there's always a risk when you've got um a piece of grass that's exposed to the sky there's always a risk that a tree will grow there 
I've had that before now as well, where uh, a tree's grown out of my garbage pit and then I've had to send somebody into the piles of corpses and dog noses and old socks and things to uh, to go and chop down a tree. Um, the tree chopper doesn't really like that. So if I can dig down to stone or if I think about it, I'll put a floor down to make sure that trees don't grow. Um, yeah. It's another another wise idea that I haven't demonstrated here. And then the third lesson that I learnt about garbage pits was about a bin lid. So my lever here, and let's get somebody to pull that lever, which will lower the drawbridge down below and crush all of the garbage that we've got there. It's linked to two drawbridges, the one downstairs that crushes the stuff and then a bin lid up top that covers the hole. Because nice. another experience I had, um, I had gotten into the habit of crushing the garbage and the corpses and things as soon as I'd, if I'd emptied my corpse stockpile, I'd pull the lever straight away so that I didn't have corpses lying around upsetting the dwarfs get the corpses thrown down there, get them crushed. But now I need to go and pull the lever again to raise the drawbridge again. And one time I forgot. So what happened was I'd forgotten that the drawbridge wasn't raised. The drawbridge was still lowered. I had some more um, refuse to throw down there and I had a bunch of body parts in my corpse stockpile and I got someone to throw arms and legs and rotten heads and ears and things from um, we'd had a child go berserk and they hadn't buried one of the body parts of the child we had a, a weird beast that was in bits and uh, and a couple of other corpses. I can't remember why I had a couple of other corpses. Uh, a couple of enemy corpses. And uh, yeah, I'd thrown them all down the pit. And it wasn't till I went to pull the lever that I realised everything was on top of the drawbridge instead of underneath the drawbridge. And on the surface around the garbage pit uh, was a bunch of surface farms. And I was thinking, this this isn't going to be pretty, is it? <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> so I thought, well, nothing for it. We've got to pull the lever. So I pulled the lever. The drawbridge raised and it catapulted all of those like llama cartilages and weird beast feet and rotten body parts and <laughs> it just rained bits of rotten gore and stuff it was all just flung in a huge area all over oh my, my farms a trauma was anyone harmed <laughs> no one was injured thankfully Good. but gosh they were traumatized and of course they could have been injured like if when the drawbridge catapults like a goblin head at tremendous speed out of a pit. If anybody had been caught by that, yeah, they could have been killed by uh, by like falling feet. <laughs> you got to be careful, Sal. You're giving me defensive ideas. <laughs> uh, but oh dear, yeah, my farmers were traumatized because they'd been living a really peaceful life. They weren't on the front line. They didn't get to see any trouble at all. They were just upstairs, undercover. There's a, a a similar sort of setup as this there was a roof on top they never saw anything of any problem and then all of a sudden they've got noses raining down on them <laughs> it was yeah definitely emotional damage to those poor farmers and somebody in chat said i prevent that by putting a bin lid i've got a, a drawbridge on the top that um that lowers to stop anybody from throwing anything down if my drawbridge on the bottom is down and I was like, that's such a good idea. <laughs> and so ever since, I've always put a bin lid. Um, and since I started putting bin lids down, now I don't have any issues at all. Um, what I do need to be careful of is, because I use garbage zones to 
move stuff like for quantum stockpiles and things yeah go volcano <laughs> chat describes it as um just going back to your earlier point where you were using uh -huh. um water using the river to carry it away yeah if you combined these two ideas and then you had the obviously you know somewhere you could dispose of it and then a waterway bringing it off the map would, would these items be in game like in the world as well or would they would they disappear as well i mean would your would your refuse end up in the in the local <laughs> human town kind of thing down the, down the river getting used or uh... <laughs> well when you when something ends up in the river it will it won't get flushed off the map that was kind of what I was hoping was going to happen, but it doesn't. Okay. It will get... Uh, in fact, I might be able to see some. What have we got down there? That's a bolt. If I go to the end of the river... It, yeah. So, down here, this is where the river's leaving the map. And we've got skeletons and socks and boots and dresses and um, yet yeah, more skeletons and socks and things all uh, all flush towards the end of the river so it'll hang around at the river exit but it won't actually um flow out there uh, but maybe one day it may maybe be one day. yeah is, is there, would it be possible to make that a refuse there so it does degrade but have it like closed off from the dwarfs hmm I think you would have to pump water out of there and then put the stockpile down but so you can't put a stockpile also... onto liquid then it has to be no apparently not okay. Certain... yeah okay yeah um yeah it won't let me put it's something i've never tried <laughs> Let's it's all right i was just, just, just wondering yeah yeah like, you know. no can't put a um a stockpile down uh under the water. What was the... Was it giving me an error message? No, it wasn't saying that it's blocked or anything. Just, just one There go. you go. Yeah. I, I would love to be able to flush our garbage down the river. I had a fortress where I captured a vampire and I was trying to convert a lot of people to vampirism by mm -hmm. forcing them to drink the water with the tainted blood. Yeah. And I thought... Why don't I do this in the river? We're upstream from the humans. And we turn <laughs> all of the humans into vampires, and I was very sad that the legends did not say that happened. It seems to just <laughs> end the simulation at the borders. But hey, maybe when we get boats and magic, maybe this will come to Maybe. Um, now, you'll notice all of that stuff that's in the river down there. Uh, it's actually a good point. Let's, um, let's go back over there. And uh, we'll just have a quick look at standing orders. And so I'm interested, uh, Scooty Lou, how you set up your uh, standing orders. You notice all of this stuff's forbidden. The dwarves haven't run out to grab this stuff. Uh, and that's because my standing orders are set up to automatically uh, forbid anything. So... If I go to the labor menu and standing orders and if we have a look under refuse and dumping, they gather refuse, they ignore outdoor refuse and ignore outdoor vermin remains. They save corpses, skulls, bones, shells, skins, hair and wool and other objects. But under sieges and forbidding, I set everything to forbid. Now, typically, most of this will be set to allow by default. So, usually, claim your dead, uh, claim your death items, and I think it is claim other death items is the other default one. Um, but yeah, I set everything to forbid. So anybody dies anywhere, and them and their stuff are automatically forbidden. And then I can choose what, where, and when um, corpses and their their stuff is collected. Uh, the reason why I do that is because 
there's always a risk that a dwarf will want to go and collect something that I don't want them to focus on. Uh, so these these corpses here, supposing these were inside my fortress, uh, there's all of this stuff. Now, the dwarfs are... They get upset when they see corpses, especially if they don't see corpses very often. If they're, if they're not used to seeing battles and things fighting. My dwarves live quite a sheltered life. What I don't want is for all of the other items to be collected before someone collects the corpse. So if I was coming to clean this stuff up, I would just unforbid the skeleton first. And I would get, well, it wouldn't be a skeleton at that point. It'd be a, a live, it'd be a, a live corpse. No, it would be a, a um, it'd be a whole a fresh corpse. corpse. A fresh corpse, yeah. <laughs> and I'd want them to get rid of the corpse before anything else for two reasons. One is because that way there's only one dwarf that's exposed to the corpse, not however many come down to collect all the other stuff. Uh, and also because I don't want them dealing with all of the other things. I want them to get that corpse out of there before it starts turning to miasma. Um, uh, once I once they've dealt with the corpse, then I'll unforbid other stuff if I decide to. Because it might be that whatever has died in the fortress might be wearing some item of clothing that I don't want my dwarves to have access to. Now, looking at this stuff here. Whoever it was who died down here, um, which was one of the undead, they didn't have access to anything. And this one? No, but for example, it could be that whatever died down there had some underwear. <coughs> um, if it was, I mean, this is a human. I'm surprised that they didn't have. They had a bizarre mix of clothes, actually. No trousers. Um, no pants. No pants, but they did have one glove and one sock. Oh, no, two gloves. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, so this is this is a uh, must have been a human, and they've turned up with. Actually, no, some of these are not human items. I've no idea how some of this ended up mix. down here. Yeah, very Maybe odd. Maybe they mix got dressed in the dark. <laughs> Maybe the things that came out of the well were gloved hands, like socks. <laughs> Actually, Maybe they're humans with dwarf friends? I'm not sure. I think it might be that there's a mixture in here of a human corpse and a dwarf corpse. Um, maybe their items have got mixed up and some have been pushed one way and some pushed the other. Uh, that would explain why there is actually a pair of large chain leggings. Still no trousers. Like at least one dwarf. <laughs> at least one dwarf went down there and immersed themselves in the corpse stew. Indeed. Yeah. Um, again, probably enemies of the un probably the undead. Um, wasn't one of my dwarfs. I don't think I've lost any merchants or any visitors on this map. But uh, yeah, if um, if somebody dies and they are wearing something that my dwarfs aren't wearing. So if we go have a look at one of my dwarfs. Everybody in my civilization, uh, when a dwarf turns up, they are... Oh gosh, this one likes likes the jewellery. <laughs> uh, my dwarfs... Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, my dwarfs, when they arrive, are wearing some upper body wear, uh, some lower body wear. Uh, it's usually in this fortress, it's either dresses or skirts. Uh, dresses or shirts that they turn up with and either trousers or skirts a pair of shoes pair of socks pair of gloves and that's all the migrants wear when they arrive so i don't want these dwarfs to get access to underwear uh headwear um any coats or cloaks 
I don't want them to have access to any of the overwear, like vests. Because there's, there's multiple layers that dwarfs can wear. And once one of them has got access to a piece of clothing that fits in a different slot, a different clothing slot, then they'll all want them. So mittens, for example, go over the top of gloves. Mittens don't replace gloves. They wear mittens over gloves. So Interesting. If, a, if a dwarf gets a pair of mittens, then they are going to, they can't replace them because I'm not making mittens. So they'll wear them until they rot off their body. And they'll get really unhappy about that. So if I start making mittens to replace this dwarf's mittens as they wear out. Well, we've got another dwarf over here. And this dwarf also doesn't have any mittens. So that means it might not be this dwarf that gets the mittens to replace the rotten ones that they're wearing. Um, it might be this dwarf that doesn't have any mittens. It might be this dwarf that also doesn't have any mittens. In fact, my entire fortress will then want to become equipped with mittens. <laughs> so we, uh, and then it means, so yeah, one dwarf gets a pair of mittens. Everybody wants mittens. And I have to add another item of clothing to the set of items that everybody wears. So I'm very controlling over what what clothes I release into my dwarf's um, wardrobe. <laughs> so does that mean if you have migrants coming to your lovely fortress mm -hmm. wearing mittens, then they're going to curse your fortress with a desire for mittens? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, that seems kind of hard to control. <laughs> Or Good somebody man. turns up and they're wearing a hood, or so somebody's wearing a cloak or a coat. <coughs> then to unless I, unless I'm prepared to allow that dwarf to suffer the trauma of having clothes rot off their body, then okay. I have to equip everybody uh, with those clothes. Now there used to be the particular problem with underwear. Uh, because dwarfs couldn't make their own underwear. And so if a goblin or an elf died in your fortress and you didn't have the clothes forbidden, then everyone in the fortress would make a beeline for, the, for that underwear uh, because yep. none of your dwarfs would have underwear and they'd all want it. And as soon it's as... It's fashion, <laughs> sweetie. Look it up. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like Sal's the bouncer on the door. It's like, well, you're not dressed right. You're not coming in. Okay, okay. <laughs> These, these are good tips for vanilla, for, for our viewers and users out there who have installed DF hack. There's a lovely <laughs> utility that's called clean owned, and you can give it an argument of a lowercase x, and that flags all of the clothing that is tattered in your fortress for dumping. So you don't have to endure so much of the trauma that dwarves experience from having the clothing rot off of their body. <laughs> Yeah, getting them to take clothes off in vanilla is really difficult. So even yep. if, if they're wearing something and you forbid it, so I can say, that sock, I want you to take that sock off. It's You're not allowed to wear it anymore. Uh, I want you to dump it. <laughs> it doesn't matter which combination of buttons you use. It's not going to cause them to put it down. They don't care. It's theirs. They own it. They're, they're not going to listen to you. Um, and yeah, they'll unless they've got a replacement, they'll wear it until it rots. So <laughs> that's um, yeah. So that was a. So that's why I forbid things. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I forbid things. It just helps to control it, control, and then we can go out and decide when to collect it, when to hand it, when to, what and when to allow into the fortress. Uh, but also dealing with the corpses first before I deal with the loot just limits the impact on the the dwarf's mental health. Um, you mentioned miasma earlier, so what, what, hmm. what are the actual effects when you have like uh, a cloud of miasma appear like in your forts? Um, 
totally asking for a friend. Not, not me. <laughs> Dwarfs that are exposed to miasma have um, have long term bad memories about it. Uh, okay. It can actually change their personality. It's that severe. Oh, okay. I wonder if I've got anybody yeah. that's they they really dwell on it. Imagine they showing do. up to your office job and you hear you you smell a rotting jackal corpse coming from a broom closet. I feel like that's really gonna stick with you. Indeed. Affect the way you look at your workplace. I was just looking to see if I had this one's not got any negative thoughts though. Um yes. Yeah, I can look uh... through mine, see if we have any. Yeah, she hasn't even got any any changes to her personality. I thought we might get somebody who's had a core personality change. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, here's an example of somebody who's had a personality change. So, uh, Galactic can get caught up in internal deliberations when action is necessary. A strengthening after seeing Domas touch Hatchet's dead body in the year 503. So that is a personality change that's come as a result of seeing a dead body. And miasma can have that straight, that same sort of effect. Now that will have been bothering uh, Galactic for a long, long time. It shouldn't be bothering Galactic now. Once it's... Um, once... Once a dwarf has been mulling over that dead body for a long time, uh, or miasma for that matter, it'll affect their memories for a long time until eventually um, it starts to change, it makes a change to their personality. That's kind of the equivalent of them coming to terms with it. But yeah, if we yeah. have a look back over their long term memories, we should see. Ah, here we go. So, yeah, spring 503. N years. Yeah. So Galactic was uneasy dwelling about, about seeing the dead body, uh, but eventually became more cautious. Which is why Galactic can no longer... Oh, look, see. Uh, free remembering wearing old clothing, learned to disdain decorum. Huh? So sometimes the, the bad memories uh, that will be causing them stress will eventually have possibly a positive effect on a change to their personality at least you know what affects that you know what can affect <laughs> the positive versus negative because i'm looking at my fortress right now and it says he almost never feels discouraged after seeing a goblin's dead body in the year 105. it's uh, it's completely random as far as i've seen i i did do a lot of digging i couldn't find any correlation between a dwarf's personality original personality and what change happened to them as a result of seeing either a good thing or a bad thing there there seems to be a a correlation between whether it was a good thing that's changed their personality or a bad thing that's changed their personality so um it's common for dwarfs that have become parents to have a positive change to their personality and typically they either like peace and quiet more or they value merriment parties and merriment more or they value their leisure time more you can see how those things are interrelated i've only had yeah. one dwarf that um that was very uneasy after becoming a parent. The rest of them had, um, for the rest of them it was all positive thoughts and then treat changes to their personality that seemed to correlate to that. Um, the other changes to the personalities, I haven't seen a correlation. Okay, so it's largely random is, is what it seems and sometimes it's just safer to not roll the dice. <laughs> on, yeah. On trauma <laughs> improving your dwarves. Yeah. But um, I'm still keeping still keeping my eyes open to see if I spot anything else. The, because there are, like, having children in your fortress is, for me at least, is one of the most frequent life-changing events for a dwarf. It's the one that I've seen the most. 
but um yeah i'm keeping an eye on other things like uh wearing old clothes does that mostly affect their things like their decorum um their need for privacy or otherwise or their their do they have thoughts about whether they're greedy or not greedy? Don't know their thoughts about material items. Just keeping an eye on stuff like that um, to find out. But, so, Sal, hmm. I have a question about corpses and refuse, if you yeah. don't mind. So, I have been looking at the stockpile mm -hmm. settings, and there's a setting for refuse, and there's a setting for corpses. Yeah. And inside of the refuse category, there's a corpses and body parts yeah. category, and in the corpses... It's just a list of all the different species. My yeah. question that we can answer for chat is, what's the difference between corpses and refuse subcategory corpses? <laughs> yeah, indeed. So uh, I actually don't know whether... Yeah, so dwarf is still under corpses. A sentient creature will not go into a refuse stockpile. So even though dwarf corpses appear under corpses... And I wonder what we have under here. Whether, it, yeah, it looks like this is a, okay, so it's the same list under both, but they are sorted yeah. differently. So sentient creatures will be put in the uh, corpse stockpile and non-sentient creatures uh, will be put into a refuse stockpile. So, okay. Um, so is there a is there a, a sliding scale of effect then for a dwarf seeing a dead llama or seeing a, a dead another dead dwarf or yeah they, or, or other monster or something? They don't seem to be bothered at all. It doesn't have any effect on them at all uh, when they see the dead bodies of animals. Now I'm not sure okay. if that's true. Of Unless it's a pet. old dwarf. Yeah, yeah. Except pets. Okay. They they get upset when they see their when their own pets die and they uh, there are some dwarfs who have a very strong affinity to nature i'm not sure what they think about seeing dead animals um have i got one because we've seen a fair amount of dead animals in this fortress uh let me just check i should have a category for those dwarfs Nature lovers, who's there? Vedafolna. Let's have a look at Vedafolna. Vedafolna, have you seen a dead animal? And what did There's you think? A lot think? of legendary weaponsmiths there. Yeah, it's um, it's the thing that I focus my dwarfs on. Do you build trap components? I do. Very nice. What's your what's your preferred trap component? I want to suck up all the all the sal tips <laughs> I can. <laughs> So if I'm making trap components, um, I will often make the corkscrews because they're, they're as good a trap components as anything else, but they're also very useful um, if I need a, a screw for a pump. Uh, just looking to see if I find Vedafall or Miss Vedafall. Here, I'll see if I can find any animal lovers. This is cat based. There we go. So do the other visitors to your, to your forts, uh, I mean, I, I'm guessing it probably varies from um, like one creature to another, but are they affected by the same kind of sort of mood? I mean, presumably humans are fairly similar in being affected by the sight of corpses and rotting corpses. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. I mean, is there a sliding scale on that in terms of like, you know, your, your, your regular etin may be not so bothered, but... <laughs> I'm guessing necromancers in particular must be pretty um, pretty used to the site for that. The short answer is different civilizations have different sets of ethics. So a goblin will care about different things compared to a human or an elf or a dwarf. That's the short sure. answer. I know that Sal knows more about this than I do. She can probably give a, a better, more in-depth answer. There's... I just think it like a ring of corpses around your fort. Like, it's <laughs> not, not going to be a... A, you know, you might persuade like human crossbow men that come and hunt dwarves, but you're probably not going to dissuade necromancer. Well, it's actually going to be necromancer field day, isn't it? I suppose <laughs> yeah, thinking about it. True. So all that's going to happen is it's going to stress them, 
um, yeah, if a necromancer comes across a field of corpses, then you've probably got a bigger enemy than you have before. Um, yeah, yes. Even if they're even if they're really freaked out about it. Uh, no, it doesn't look like Vedafolna has seen any um, corpses of animals. There's definitely some of my dwarfs who have seen, but yeah, they they they're not bothered by um, seeing dead animals. I've been looking for this for this animal lover Must trait. Where will we find those? Is that oh, in those. is that in thoughts, personality? So personality. So let's have a look at Vedafolna again, because we know Vedafolna's one of them. Actually with Vedafolna it was a personality change. Uh, so it might stand out a bit more. Uh, she can easily become absorbed in art and the beauty of the natural world beauty of the natural world yeah. excellent thank you so things like that you'll see this one's um this one's quite extreme but yeah it's usually a little a little more toned down than that but uh, yeah art and the beauty of the natural world is usually a, a mention about that um but uh, yeah going back to refuse and corpses so this is one way to get rid of your refuse and corpses is to crush it and that that way it ceases to exist it's it doesn't leave the map and go elsewhere into the world it's just gone uh, gone from your frame rate as well and but that is not an ideal way of dealing with your own people so somewhere down here yes i have a whole bunch of tombs so this tomb zone uh in that coffin there is my chief mechanic i've got someone's pet cat in that one uh, Not very considerate <laughs> talia claybone fath the cat zuntia the rabbit ushria the duck dodod the cat Feb the cat, Imush the cat, and that one's free. So when you, uh, when you put Where down... one dwarf in a, a room full of pets? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> now I've got two dwarfs actually. That are two, I might even have more. A three. I've had um, one death due to injury. The rest were old age deaths. Um... Yeah, the one death due to injury was um, because I'd accidentally put a necromancer in my army. And we got attacked by a troop of monkeys. <laughs> they were coming in to try and steal stuff. And I got my squad to go and attack the monkeys. And the necromancer kept on raising the monkeys uh, from the dead. And uh, the necromancer alone killed the five monkeys eight times. Um... And uh, yeah, unfortunately, they, once they're raised from the dead, they're actually harder to deal with than they were when they were alive because they're more aggressive. They don't tire. They don't get afraid. Uh, and so, yeah, ended up with my chief mechanic being uh, killed by the uh, by the monkeys. Um, but yes, when you when you've got a coffin. Um, I'll just remove that so and then I can set it back up again. So when you're, it's always a good idea to have at least one coffin. In fact, have I got any more? Because I wouldn't mind putting down a few more. I've probably had some on order. I have some empty undesignated zones in my crypts if you want me to demonstrate. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just put these down and then we'll go have a, a look at yours. Sure. And just just for the quality of the stream, I'm going to turn off my uh, my virtual webcam, and we'll try just streaming the game footage yeah, to see sure. if the bit rate's any better. Okay, so once you've uh, you make some coffins, and then the way I've been doing this in this particular fortress, where I want the coffins all together, um, I just use paint instead of multi, and I do it one coffin at a time except and then do i want dwarfs 
or do I want pets? And it's mostly pets. Then I want another tomb. That tomb over that coffin. And I'll assume pets. Tomb. Accept. Pets. Do dwarves get a very happy thought from having their pets entombed? That's That's been something that I more or less avoid. Am I missing out on great good thoughts for my dwarves by skipping that? Um, it, it doesn't give them happy thoughts, but it completely mitigates the negative thoughts. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I might need to start doing that. That's quite a dense way of packing coffins in. So would you would you look to fill that entire room up eventually or um, just line the walls? Yeah, I'll probably fill the room eventually with okay. the coffins. Um, mostly of uh, people's pets. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm guessing I'm guessing pets turn over a lot quicker than your dwarfs. Yeah, because some of the some of the pets don't have very long at all. Um, don't have long life lifespans like the cavies and the rabbits and things. Okay, right. Uh, Scooty Louv. We're going to go over to your fortress. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Sure. Let me know if I need to change anything. So in terms of, um, obviously, the quality of the coffins and the, the quality of the surroundings, then they're quite generally happy, at least for their pets, I assume, then that they're fairly simple, fairly simple burial, fairly simple coffin sort of setup. Yeah, for... Um, there are some dwarfs that want specific that have specific requirements um so some of your nobles will require a specific quality to the tomb they'll they'll insist on knowing where their tomb is going to be in advance so your mayor's not interested but um barons Counts, dukes, yeah. kings, uh, they all want to have a tomb allocated in advance. And okay. the quality of the coffin, the quality of the engravings, the, the material you make the wall out of, the statues that you put in that room with them, uh, that will all count towards the value. And depending on the status of your noble as to how much value they want in their tomb room so just just a quick general question on on rooms mm. um obviously you've got a lot of different types of furniture that you can potentially put in places does it actually matter assuming that you meet the basic requirements of like an office saying a, a table and a chair what the other bits of furniture actually are in the room it just or is it just they just add to the value of the room overall so for, for example i mean if we did put a, a table and a chair in a in a tomb room, would yeah. that add to the value, or yeah. would that yep. not count? It would. It you, was okay. You might get. Um, there are certain furniture requirements for certain rooms. So, for a mayor, I think the mayor wants two chests somewhere right. okay. in some of their rooms, and you can see it on the noble screen. Yeah, so there you go. Scooty Lou's got it up on my screen at the moment. And um, so a mayor wants an office and that office, uh, an office, a bedroom and a dining room of their own. And they need two chests, an armor stand, a weapon rack uh, and a cabinet. But they can be spread around any of those rooms. Okay. Yep. Mine are over in the Sphinx. So the I aesthetics. Have... Yeah, sorry. I was just saying, like the aesthetics, you, you, you know, it's quite a bit of freedom. For yeah, you yeah, to yeah. Do with that, Indeed. Then. Okay, cool, oh, yeah. cool. Sorry. Loads Thanks. of Cheers. freedom. I mean, the weapon rack and the armor stand are sitting inside the dining room, mm -hmm. and the boxes and the cabinets are sitting in one of their two bedrooms. So you have lots of freedom. Sometimes you'll get a demand uh, from a mayor or a, a baron that says, "I want a statue in my tomb." I think uh, we did a stream with Scoundrel. And Scoundrel was complaining about one of his uh, one of his nobles who was insisting on having 
multiple statues. He had eight statues in his tomb oh already and wanted another one. Also, really like statues. That's a, that's a fun work order to fulfill <laughs> because you can make custom images of everything. Low key, that is one of my favorite features of Dwarf Fortress. Just making outstanding images, like my gatehouse with the dwarf embracing the cat and the cat embracing the dwarf. I just think it's adorable. Indeed. Okay, do you so, want to? Yeah. So. Dwarves can be memorialized mm -hmm. by using a slab and engraving their name on it after they have passed. Or you can set up rooms like this. I'm just showing off a different version of crypts compared to what Sal has yep. done. I have enclosed them in doors so that I can make use of the multi. If you don't have doors, you can't get any use out of the multi. And watch how quickly we can designate these. Done. We made 15 right there. But if you want to go in and specify that they are for animals or for dwarves or both, you'll have to go in and set each of them individually. So if I was setting this up to be an animal cemetery, I would designate all of them. I would go into each one of these and set them up to be only used for that doggo. Do you know if there's a faster way to multi-designate these or is it just carpal tunnel fortress? Yeah, yeah I don't think there's a faster way to do it. Okay. Maybe so, in the future. I mean, every patch is just getting better and better with quality of life. Yeah. So the value of the walls and the carvings that you've got on the walls are all adding into the value of the, yeah, uh, yeah. the crypts that you've got there. Okay. Yep. There are fun. Yeah. There are a few fun little tricks for just boosting the value through the roof, like putting down a single lever and hooking that lever up to any number of mechanisms and just stacking mechanism yeah, on yeah. a single tile. That, that's the okay. old style. I think we can use pedestals and uh, what are they called? Display cases mm -hmm. and just loading artifacts onto them. Do you know if that still works, so? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pedestals seem interesting. I've, I've set a church up with pedestals uh, and then there seems to be like, you know, thieves that will come in and oh, yeah. <laughs> basically nick the items <laughs> off, the, off the pedestals. Especially so, yeah, artifacts. I'm not sure about those. Yes, yes. You know, while we're here, I can mm -hmm. I can show off another method for dumping corpses and refuse. Yep. I am using an incinerator method. But just as a tip to those who, who don't dabble in magma, you need to be very careful about the magma mist that sprays out. So, for example, I actually lost my first broker on behalf of magma mist. They were channeling out some tiles for our magma industry here. And my broker was standing right next to it, and a boulder fell into the magma, caused the mist to spray out, lit her on fire, and she melted. We oh, lost dear. our broker. <laughs> so, I learned from my lesson, and I decided to make this trash chute right here. So let's designate for some dumping. Then my dwarves should run on over here. Now, this is, this is a pretty mature fortress, so it might take a little while yeah. for them to show up. But I do have a lovely lever set up here, and although it looks invisible, there's a bridge here. There's a Gabbro bridge set up to be a retracting bridge, kind of like the top of a bin. Yeah. Like Sal was talking about. Uh, oh, here, here we, we go. go. Someone's coming in. Getting all sorts of nasty thoughts from seeing dead goblins and dwarves and whatnot. Oh, nope, yes, nope. doing something different. <laughs> Must have what been coming down to here? collect a tooth or something? Something. Let's see if anyone is going to dump an item. Lots of building going on. No one wants to dump. That's sad. I think we'll just have to wait for them. Because turns out that in the code, the jobs search for dwarves. The dwarves do not search for jobs. <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> Uh, while we're wait waiting for the dwarves to come and dump into the magma, have you had any ex inter and this is a question to both of you, had any interesting experience with ghosts? Ah, here, here we, go. we go. Here, I'm going to take the hauled item. It is a goblin right lower leg, and I'm going to follow it with the camera so we Good can Good idea. Yeah, splat. And it is melting, and now it is gone. So you get to see the material physics of Dwarf Fortress at play. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just incinerate on contact, 
like in Minecraft. It actually takes time to go through the tissues and the sinew. It's very, very interesting stuff. Indeed. I once had a dwarf explore an awful lot of the magma sea for me while it was falling down. Oh, I... That's so funny you mentioned that. When when it was like launch day, I named a dwarf Tarn Adams because I on my stream I allow people to name dwarves for the for the simple price of one Scooty Ruble. That's our <laughs> channel point. Someone named one Tarn Adams. And he dodged into a huge, huge, huge magma pipe, and he had so much fat on him, the dwarf did, that as he was falling to the core of the earth, he just discovered all these caverns and a magma sea and all sorts of spoilerific <laughs> content that I won't mention. And I just thought that was hilarious that he survived for so long. I think if they're wearing armor as well, they might survive longer because I'm not sure about this, but I don't think their body starts to burn until after their armor has melted. That's so interesting. Here's so you mentioned it's ghosts. a one-way trip. Um, I did. I did have a ghost. Yeah, I had. Um, I had somebody possessed by a ghost once upon a time. Um, oh, think, that's strange. Anyway. Mood. Yes. Have you actually seen any ghosts in your fortress? Uh, possibly a few. <laughs> by a few, probably like. Uh, uh, half the population, maybe, at one point. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, no. Um, um, I, had a, I had a pretty interesting situation when I was doing a challenge run on a, on a haunted glacier. Mm. I had a very inattentive doctor dwarf who was just not doing their job, and they left a dwarf to dehydrate on oh, their dear. hospital bed. That dwarf died. We didn't have the resources to memorialize them. That dwarf came back as a ghost, and the doctor got bit by a cave crocodile. The doctor was brought to rest in the hospital bed, and the vengeful spirit of the dwarf that they ignored was hovering over the bed that they had died in and hacked off their leg. <laughs> the doctor lost a leg from the vengeful spirit of the dwarf that they ignored. And I'm just saying, I can't make this up. The emergent <laughs> storytelling in Dwarf Fortress is immaculate. And it's the best game ever made. You can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, uh, if you don't have the ability to put your dead dwarf, and not just the dwarfs, sometimes it can. This can apply to your visitors as well. If you don't have the ability to put the body in a coffin because maybe you can't access the coffin it or maybe you can't access the body it'd be too dangerous to or maybe there's just no body left because they've been crushed accidentally under a drawbridge or something um then that seem to be a problem <laughs> the way to deal with that is to put down a slab like scooty loose showing you here so if you've got a gravestone that's uh memorializing them that will lay a ghost to rest and it'll prevent a ghost from uh, from rising in the first place it's a little bit of a process to create a slab and uh, you have to go to your stone workers workshop then add a new task and create a slab then once you have a slab you right. engrave oh yeah yeah let's show that Sure. Just, just as a note to the hmm. people back home, this is not what the vanilla Dwarf Fortress menu is going to look like. Unfortunately, in this menu in vanilla, you won't see any of the nicknames. I'm using a DF hack utility called Fix Nix, or hmm. Fix Protect Nix. It replaces all of the spots where you wish the nickname was displayed, <laughs> and it places the proper nickname in there. And I love it. It's a great endorsement for the tool. Is, is there an easy way to search the... Um the engraving menu to get to the uh, uh, slabs that haven't been engraved. It will tell you um, wh which ones are not engraved. <clears throat> yeah. And if you've got any ghosts in your fortress, they always appear at the top. Right, okay. Do they? I know it did that in Classic, but I'm, I'm almost certain that the ghosts don't show up at the top. 
oh. in in uh, Steam version. Unfortunately, oh, I, I think that. you just take really good care of your dwarves, and you I was don't let say, them turn into ghosts. I ghost. haven't actually had a ghost in the Steam version. It's too good at the game, so. <clears throat> I, I'm hoping that they can they can sort the list with ghosts first, and then not memorialized, and then pets that aren't memorialized, mm. and then memorialized. That would be really nice. Maybe it's as simple as just writing a, a query, but I don't know what goes on in the behind the scenes code. I assume I assume that all the slapped um, creatures and dwarfs that you have in there they they stay for the whole game, do they? I think, and, and Sal can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that as long as the building is built, so mm -hmm. like, we have we have this slab built for Sleazy, yeah. and this is the only memorial for Sleazy, and if this were to be destroyed by a magma flow, or to be deconstructed by myself, or a building destroyer, I think if it's just sitting around, it starts a timer, and when that timer runs out, the ghost rises. Yeah. Okay. But there is a... <clears throat> it's not 100% guaranteed. There is a, um, um, a a dice roll as to whether or not you're going to get a ghost. Oh. You've got a child playing in the corpse. Oh, playing with the corpse there. There's literally <laughs> a corpse here. There's a dead alpaca here. <laughs> just, just playing with its bones. Normal dwarf <laughs> stuff. Oh, come on. Maybe I'll make additional tombs out on my surface in my not-so-great pyramids. <laughs> maybe that's what I'll fill them with. Or maybe I'll stick them inside of my cat sphinx. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I would love ideas from, from chat someday. <laughs> so we've covered how to deal with your refuse and your garbage. How to bury your undead. Uh, how to how to and why <laughs> to prevent ghosts if you don't have a body to bury um what else oh i tell you what i was so sorry just to confirm yeah if you do have the body to bury and you put it in a coffin there's no need for a slab is Correct. that what you're saying okay yep. cool you and they can just do one body wish. part they, they might find the dwarf's tooth and everything else was vaporized by a dragon they can just stick that tooth in Happy ghost. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as long as they're memorialized somehow, they're they're kind of happy about that. I have um, I have had a situation where something like um, I don't know somebody's foot ended up in the coffin, and the rest of them ended up underneath a, a crusher drawbridge, and everyone was fine. They were they were still quite happy that. There was a, a foot to uh, <clears throat> a foot in a coffin to memorialise about. Uh, something that's worth noting is when it comes to burying your dead. If you've got a corpse stockpile, um, I keep my corpse stockpiles and my refuse stockpiles up on the surface so they don't create any miasma. It's a bit easy to forget. <laughs> Uh, it's a bit easy to forget that they're up there and um, it's one of the worst things that can happen to a dwarf is to have to endure the decay of a loved one <clears throat> so I've got I'll just switch back to my fortress a second because I know where I've got one of those uh, that I can show you are you talking about a surface stockpot? Um, no, the effect of a the effect on a dwarf of Perfect. their of a loved one decomposing in a corpse stockpot. Oh, I'll break my heart. Here we go. Go back to Vedafolner again. So yeah. Uh, so Vedafolner was forced to endure the decay of a spouse in the year 508. Um, Vedafolner was on the verge of breaking for a couple of years as a result of that. 
Um, she's gotten over it now. Now she very rarely develops negative feelings towards things as a result. But uh, yeah, if you if you allow your spouse, if you allow somebody's loved one to decay in a stockpile, it can have a really seriously bad negative effect on them. Uh, getting your dwarves in a coffin quickly before they start to rot. So it's something you want to do before their corpse starts to decay decompose is get them in a coffin and they will automatically bury them as long as there's <clears throat> a coffin with a tomb zone over it so it's pretty bad much. if it's a friend a passing acquaintance a child a grandparent and anyone that that dwarf cares about and they they mm. suffer that it's going to be like miasma times mm. a lot it's it's really bad just wondering, actually, who else it affected, because that never occurred to me. So, Vedafolna, uh, your other relations? Uh, Wunderer, was it children. your... Was it your father, or was that a different father? Might have been a different father, actually. So, if we have a look at your relations, your your youngest son. I'm pretty sure it was his dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Talia who died. Do you remember that? Being forced to endure the decay of a father, and now he doesn't handle stuff. stress well. So that means that he will break faster. And his sister? Um, she's now quick to anger after being forced to endure, endure the decay of a father. And this is because I forgot to put the tomb zone over the top of the coffin. And oh, so no. they left the father's corpse in a corpse stockpile on the surface. So I saw a question roll through chat. It's a question uh -huh. that I have as well, talking about, is there a way to assist dwarves in acquiring an object? I, I want to take this a step further. Is there a way to force it? Because I have set up a clever burrow and three different stockpiles that all give to each other with no bins but I just cannot make my ungreedy dwarf acquire something. <laughs> I just can't make it happen. The um, the easiest way to do it is to, yeah, make sure that they've got the ability to move crafts between stockpiles. Um, so I get my dwarfs hauling to and from the trade depot. Anytime a trader comes, I have them haul crafts. Uh, from this stockpile here they haul whatever crafts I've got over to the trade depot and then while the traders trading they'll come and fill this craft stockpile with other stuff I've been on a totem binge recently to get rid of a bunch of schools we had you um, should definitely talk about that you know how many people in the dwarf fortress community don't know what totems are where they come from or how to make them <laughs> yeah you just make so them out many. of schools um, easy peasy so yeah they carry stuff just got this little stockpile here it doesn't allow bins it allows all of the different types of crafts plus totems and yeah they just get carried to and from the uh the trade depot uh every time we get a trader but i think that seems to make a real difference as to whether or not somebody will claim an item is their bedroom their bedroom yeah it used to be that <clears throat> when they claim things, they would put it inside the coffers. Now, I haven't seen them store things in the coffers anymore, but it still seems to make a difference that they've got somewhere to store things. Oh, maybe that's maybe that's the missing ingredient <clears throat> for me. Yeah, <clears throat> so they don't seem to be taking them to the coffers, but um, they still seem to need them to to be able to grab a thing so the cabinets are where they store their old clothes 
But the coffers are where they used to store things like figurines. Um, <clears throat> they wouldn't necessarily wear all of their rings and crowns and amulets and stuff, but totems, figurines, scepters, they didn't used to carry with them. They would take them and then store them in a coffer. And uh, yeah, they don't seem to be storing them in the coffers anymore. I remember the days when they would. Them. It seems like mm. a feature that works and then sometimes it doesn't. It's just kind of on off, on off. Yeah, I haven't seen it work. Uh, I haven't seen them store anything in a coffer. <clears throat> Excuse me, since the Steam release. Uh, so I think that something's preventing them from using the coffers now for storage. But um, But if they've got a coffer, then they can claim it. And I've seen them walking around with the items that they would otherwise have normally stored. But uh, the things they can wear, they don't seem to claim those as frequently unless they've got a coffer. So pretty sure that the coffers have a significant effect on whether or not they claim an item. Yeah, I'll check my dwarves out. Oh. Do coffers and chests work in dormitories? Do you know? I don't know. No idea. See, there's a dwarf there. They've dropped their amulet on the floor. Oh, it's Vedafulma. Uh, instead of putting it in the coffer. Normally, they'd have put it in the coffer. Uh, if they wanted something but didn't want to carry it with them. I think we might have just stumbled onto a cause because I have endless crafts and amulets and rings and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I only put cabinets in their rooms mm -hmm. yeah i wonder if my hmm hmm interesting yeah stuff. give that a try because that this them requiring a coffer to acquire an item is something that's been around for a while yeah my my mayor is the only one that has a box it's it's a green glass coffer and mayor has a ring no one else let's, does uh, let's bring think, you back i think you nailed it yeah yeah wow there you go. So let's have a look at your mare. Yeah, sure. Let's bring up the mare. Their name is Vavok. Let's see. Vavok the mare. Even though they're in the military, they have a dog bone ring. Mm-hmm. And probably doesn't have any negative thoughts about being unable to acquire things. I guess that'd be in needs, wouldn't it? I guess maybe it's been so long they need to acquire something else. Mm-hmm. But then if we just pick on a random dwarf like this one. Oh, no, he's got they a have ring. a ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How odd. Hmm. I wonder <clears throat> if it's because there's a box inside of the hospital and they're a doctor. Let's see. We have a clothier here. Oh, they have a ring. With rings, yeah. Odd. I guess it was just chance that the five that I looked at a second ago <laughs> didn't. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, it does have... Uh... Uh, it definitely improves their chances of acquiring an item by putting coffers in their rooms. If they've got a coffer in their room, it seems to trigger a knowledge that they've got a place to store a thing. But uh, yeah, they will get, um, they will pick up stuff. If they're, and I don't know whether it's their proximity to the stockpile or the item being in a stockpile that makes a difference to them. So whether it's, um, so I'm causing my dwarfs to go to a stockpile full of lootable items by getting them to move things around. I don't know whether it's because the items in the stockpile and it's available or whether it's because the dwarf is near the item because they're at the stockpile. I don't know which of those two mechanics it is, but yeah, as long as you've got lots of dwarves moving lots of things and they've all got coffers, then they will load up on stuff. But yeah, we can see like your dwarves have all got um, like one or two items, whereas with my dwarves and everyone having a coffer, uh, like, we were looking at Vedafolna before, weren't we? Um, Vedafolna's got a bracelet, two earrings, oh, three earrings. Where else Do they have I a see? greedy trait? Doth. Didn't think so. Let's have a look. 
probably likes earrings. Probably. I've been trying to abuse burrows where they can only go between the stockpiles and go to the food and drink places in their bedroom, and I just cannot make this one dwarf pick up their item. They just will not. Yeah. No, there's um, not no greedy trait. And if we have a look, where else are we looking? So upstairs. Oh, it was in the kitchen. We saw someone who was wearing tons of rings. Was it Galactic? A bracelet, an amulet, a bracelet, an amulet. Bracelets and amulets for uh, for Galactic. No, not um, no particular thoughts at all about material goods. Not even particularly interested in bracelets or amulets, but you know, managed to acquire a few things. Um, I may have to go look up some of your tutorial videos, Sal. <laughs> it seems like it seems like you got a real good grip on this, and I could learn a thing or two. What's this a uh, ring, bracelet, ring, bracelet, amulet, crown, earring? And what about you? Do you like? Oh, moved by art and natural beauty. So yeah, that's. Um, this is a. Are you set up with the? Oh, you're not. You should be a nature lover. And you shouldn't do anything except the nature loving work. Um, yeah, you're not particularly f interested in stuff. And you don't have a particular fondness of any trinkets. So yeah, they, um, they're quite happy to go and grab stuff just got to get them to move it around and give them a coffer and that seems to trigger it sure i'll try totems as well yeah i've not long started making totems in this fortress i, I kind of forgot about them until i was moving my butcher's workshop and uh, it was like oh yeah <laughs> it was like fields full of skulls it's like, yeah, I should really turn all of those into totems. I bet I've still got lots in my current. Yeah, look at this. I've still got bones and hooves and skulls and all kinds of things that I either need to throw out or turn into stuff. All the things. But uh, yeah, anyway, we are coming to the end of the stream. Any questions uh, from chat? Any questions from you guys? Anything to add? Anything we've missed? Hmm. Is this a reclaimed fort? No, this was a, a fort on a new site. Reclaiming is an option, is it? Uh, yes, it is. It's yeah. okay. when you go onto the world map um, at the so at the start when you're embarking on the the world map and you're choosing a location, there's uh, there's a button on the bottom that says reclaim, and you can reclaim a fortress that you've retired yourself, or you can reclaim a fortress that you lost. Um, or you can reclaim a fortress that uh, it has to be a previous dwarven site. Uh, so any of the previous sites that belong to a dwarf, you can try and reclaim those. Always worth considering, though, if a site is available to reclaim, what caused it to fall in the first place? Because whatever caused it to fall in the first place might still be there. Okay. I do have a question for you, yeah. Sal. This is this is a little bit advanced with the clothing and the tattering and whatnot. So in, in a mature fortress, you're going to have legendary dwarves that are cranking out masterworks. Mm -hmm. And my general strategy for getting rid of large amounts of destroyed clothing is just dumping them into the magma. Mm -hmm. But 
I'm sure you see where this is going. If we have masterworks getting destroyed over and over, you don't want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just upsetting my legendary dwarves. Yeah. So what I'd like to do, ideally, is, um, I I have I have methods for mass dumping destroyed clothes, but is there a way to set down a stockpile so that my masterworks get set down close to my trade depot, so that I can load it up and send those off without incurring bad thoughts? I do a similar thing with my crossbow bolts because I don't let my military use masterworks. I sell all my masterworks and everything below, they're allowed to shoot because they have the chance to get destroyed. Just wondering if you've figured hmm. out a solution for that. Uh, you can, so all of the clothing comes under finished goods and you can limit it by the quality. So if you said that only masterwork or artifacts. You'd need to do it for total quality as well. Right. So only masterwork or artifact um, items of the type armor, footwear, handwear, headwear, legwear. Um, for Mister. Yeah, you got handwear. Yeah, got yeah. Handwear. Uh, if you got, if you set it up like that and told them to put that stuff in a stockpile near the trade depot. You're going to end up with other stuff, helmets and breastplates and um, and stuff which, because you can't sort of filter further. Uh, we could change the material, I suppose. We could take metal could say off not and metal. we could enable True. plants and yarn and silk. Okay. So... I guess then the only problem we would be dealing with at that point is the issue where you can't take a dwarf take something off. You can't make them take it off. Mm. But I can get around that with DF hack. Mm -hmm. So I guess then my, my supply chain would be mass designate all of the tattered clothes for dumping and disable my magma dump. Just have them throw it in a random spot. And then I, I already have that stockpile that you were defining mm -hmm. on stream. And then I can mass claim all of those so that my dwarves haul it over yeah. there. And then everything that's left over, we dump. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's what. Thank you so much. That's been a problem. <laughs> yeah, no I problem. appreciate that. Uh, let me get rid of that before they start bringing tons of stuff up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, everybody. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you both join us uh, today. Thank you very much for having us on. It was a joy being here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's um, let's go see if we can find somebody to raid, and I shall be back on Monday night, Tuesday morning for Europeans and the forward time zones. Um, with oh gosh, I think it's Techard. Uh, we're going to be talking about military and some of the more advanced military tactics like um setting up one of the things we've been discussing was setting up patrols and uh guarding burrows and those sorts of things uh, oh man i i love that topic i think i need that topic <laughs> <laughs> let's see who's streaming <laughs> 